So tonight we're back, Sarah and I, and uh, we've had we've done a few of these conversations now, Sarah. It's just been such a joy as always. Just one, just to hang out with you uh, and just listen to what God's doing in and through you. And um, yeah, it's it's just real. Uh, I think I've introduced you twice now as being authentic. Is there any mm-hmm. other way that you would introduce Sarah Wiseman? Um, it's like an open book, I guess. <laughs> Same thing, probably. Um, and just a little bit silly sometimes. <laughs> I love a laugh. I really do love a laugh. So if we opened up this book to Chapter 3 of Sarah mm-hmm. Wiseman, what would we be reading? Chapter 3? What mm. are we going with the age of three? Or oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, if we're doing seasonal chapters, I would say that would, <laughs> I'd say that would maybe be like you've got childhood, teenagehood, maybe early twenties. We'll go with that. Um, that was when I fell in love with Jesus. It was the best chapter I'd had so far. It was amazing. Didn't care about boys didn't care about anything just was like head over heels in love with Jesus loved 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 just reading the bible we used to spend every lunch break for an hour just reading the bible and journaling you know it was like you know full-on like dating like you know yeah. it was like I was dating him I was so it was just me and him every day and I just had no distractions it was the best ever so what's it like for Sarah Wiseman to be in love? With Jesus or my husband or <laughs> generally? <laughs> Let's start with Jesus. <laughs> we'll keep it PG. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, good idea. Um, honestly, just absolute devotion. Like, but even with, with friends and people that I just love, it's like I don't know how to half love people, mm. um, which can be an issue sometimes <laughs> because I'm just like, um, I just, I, th- I think I even said it last time. I just want to like encourage and like embrace. I'm, a hu- I'm that person who comes, who's coming in like, I'm a hugger. Yeah. <laughs> and recently someone said to me like, oh, this person doesn't like hugs. And I was like, sorry, like <laughs> I, I want to hug you. And I want to like, I think the encouragement thing is big for me. Like, I think some people think I might be insincere because I just, I will just call out good things in people, Mm. but it's actually, I feel like a gift God gave me where I can look at someone and really see like amazing stuff in them. Mm. Um, And, and I prayed a lot for a long time for God to give me his heart for people. And it helps me understand why he loves so much because I feel it. And then sometimes I notice people are a bit like, Oh, like, that's a bit too much and I'm like sorry and I have to back away a bit but yeah it's just it's just affection and grace and encouragement and just giving all of myself which like I said can sometimes not be the best thing <laughs> well, <clears throat> I reckon you're in pretty good company Sarah because I reckon Jesus sort of operated from that sort of paradigm yeah yeah yeah, I relate to the story where he's like, I need to get away. And then people found him and he was like, okay, I'll, I'll do something else. Yeah, I love that story because I'm like, that. I do that all the time. Um, but yeah, it also makes me realize how hurt he must have been, you know, because it's so much harder to be rejected when you're fully out on the platter, you know, like when you open up your whole heart. It's um, quite painful. <laughs> yeah. One of the phrases you said there was that you can see the hearts of people, you can see who they really are and you call the gold out of them. Uh, There's something about being seen. I think it's a human condition. I think it's a part of our design that we are designed to be seen, to be heard, to be known, to be understood. And so often in, in our society and culture, we we silence voices, we we shut them down. And I've found in the church that we've done exactly the same thing, that we look for those key voices and we elevate those. And if you don't have one of those key voices, at times you can be pushed to the side, you can be silenced, you can even be ignored. And Sarah, I get a lot of people at the moment saying to me, I feel invisible. And and if that's our experience of church, then I'm not sure it's the the best version of church that we could be doing. Have you had any experience of feeling 
invisible? Funny you should ask that. <laughs> I, I just, I felt like that actually recently. And I feel like this is the odd part is a lot of people would look at my Instagram or like my life even and think, oh, Sarah's always talking to people and sharing and reaching out. Um, and I am. But recently I just went through this season of feeling like, but does anyone actually care about me? Like, and people might, um, you know, I don't know, like if you're giving and people are like taking what you're giving them, it doesn't always mean that they're reciprocating or um, wanting to freely give back to you. And that can just make you feel so like, if it's, if you're not coming from a place of overflow, you just, it leaves you feeling empty and then there's room for the enemy to come in and be like no one actually sees you or cares about you um people just want you to make them feel better but they don't really see who you are or love you for who you are kind of thing um and so that's just been just being real because you know don't know how else to be um I'm still on that journey of like just constantly coming back to my worth in God and and realizing that as long as he sees me, I don't need other people to see me, but at the same time, I do deserve to have valuable mm. relationships where it goes both ways. Sense. Yeah, it does. I have a belief there that we do need to see each other as humans as well. Mm. Um, I get that from uh, in Genesis 2 where God creates Adam and Adam just has God. And you and I used to sing songs years ago of all I need is you, Jesus. Remember that song? Sarah? Yeah. yeah you, want I sing, do. you want to sing it for us? Absolutely not. <laughs> That's a hard no. It's a hard no. <laughs> no deal. No um, deal. <laughs> but I often wondered about that with that Genesis chapter two concept, because God saw all that he created and still something was missing. And mm. Eve was brought into that conversation at that one point And, um, all of a sudden this beautiful moment in the in the garden of eden occurred where adam could see eve and eve could see adam and there was a connection there was a oneness of heart and spirit uh, and sarah i've known you now for a while and the concept of oneness of heart and spirit is very strong in your heart and spirit now you've just spoken about people who will take rather than than give and i think in uh, healthy places of relationship there is a there's a cross flow of that sort of stuff it's not yeah. just about giving because we are not designed just to give we are yeah. designed to also receive love love mm. others as I, as i have loved you is what jesus would say to us mm. and he would declare that it's a really great thing to do it's the thing to do and mm. uh knowing you like i do you are really really good at loving people mm. Uh, and often in, in that conversation, then we look for those relationships to flow back into us. And often in churches, we don't do relationships at that deep level, not with a lot of people. No, no, that's right. And I feel like you can even create a connect group or like a home group and go every week and still a not see the people around you. Like, I think there's a difference between being seen and being acknowledged or mm. being understood and you can go and see the same people every week and still not really see or acknowledge them or they can see but not really acknowledge you and you can just live in this place of like never really getting to the root of like who you are what connects you like what what you need and that's just devastating to me like I think and I think out of this season, I'm even in currently, I'm remembering, I never want to make somebody feel that way. Mm. Like, I don't want to just pass over people, like, and just, hi, how are you? Like, I want to make people feel really, like, I see you and I acknowledge you and I want to connect with you. And um, whenever I go through something that makes me struggle, I always come out the other side, like, oh, this is what I don't ever want to do to someone else or, you know? Mm. Yeah. How does it make you feel <clears throat> when someone does see you? Like not not just in the sense of okay, there's Sarah and she's hanging out yeah. with us, but it's the mm. understanding that as someone's actually landed in the concept of I know who Sarah Wiseman is. Well, I have this 
well, you, for instance, <laughs> it, it's uncomfortable actually sometimes because that when you say such kind things about me, which really I know is the voice of God, and you're like the big brother, like who who really sews into me. At first, I feel like, oh, that's uncomfortable. Oh, he's just that's not true. And oh, why does he think that about me? Um, which is why I have to understand that sometimes when I'm trying to love people, they put up a wall because I'm like tapping into something they're not able to see in themselves, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, but then beyond that, when that is consistent, and I think that's the key is like when that relationship and that sewing is consistent and you feel seen consistently, and especially when they see the bad part and mm. consistently love you anyway, that is the most beautiful thing in the world. And mm. that's what you have been like with me and even with my husband, Tim, and I have this beautiful friend named Kara. She's like the Holy Spirit personified. She's mm. just one of the best people I've ever met. And she just loves me. Like she loves me so genuinely, like relentlessly. She's so encouraging. And like, again, I felt uncomfortable. Like, mm. really? I don't, I think you're just a nice person. Like I did to her what people do to me. But now I just feel so safe with her you know and so okay to be myself warts and all and to know that it's almost like God has given her the blueprint of who I am mm. so even if I'm acting outside of that she still just sees who God's made me to be and it makes me feel so loved and safe and like she encourages me to come back and remember who I am and it's just the best feeling in the world really yeah it's unconditional love you know? I love that you use the word safe there as well. One of mm. the concepts that you were talking also about is sometimes it's hard to believe for yourself. And so there's an unbelief that's internal to say, oh, I can't connect those dots. I have yeah. been told consistently for my entire life that this is what I should be doing. I feel like I keep <laughs> coming up short and it's yeah. that unbelief. And you know, in when I think it's in Mark chapter six, where Jesus um, is recorded as saying um, he was unable to do many miracles because of their <clears throat> unbelief. Yeah. I wonder, Sarah, whether our own unbelief about who we are stops us from being healed. A hundred percent. I would, yeah, I would agree with that. I feel like, I feel like we can't, well, we're meant to operate from who we are. Mm. So if we can't believe it in it, it does kind of limit us a hundred percent. And that's for me, like, and I'm really going to be real now, but for me, um, that is kind of like, I, like I said, in my twenties, I had this beautiful freeing place of like, I knew who I was. Mm. I loved who I was and I felt God's love so easily. And like I said, they were like the golden years and it's only gotten better, but in a way my relationship with God has gone through some really intense, situations and um some of that has been very traumatic experiences yeah. and I feel like um as a result like trauma can happen to us and we stop seeing ourselves properly mm. because we start to see ourselves as what happened or as um through the eyes of just like okay well I'm not at my best now so even just like gaining weight right People don't see me anymore like they used to. Like people treat me differently in public or you don't get the same treatment. You meet new people and they're not as nice. Like I know it sounds crazy, but that that for me is like the such a feeling of being unseen. Mm. And I'll never forget that feeling. I know that I'll get on top of my health. I know that I, I'm literally feels like I'm carrying pain on my body sometimes because of the things I've been through but it's helped me to really see other people despite because I know that society is probably ignoring them. And yeah, I just want to make other people feel seen because I know now what it feels like to just feel quite invisible. Yeah. Again, you're expressing the heart of a, of a person who looks deeper rather than just looking at the surface as well. Mm -hmm. And again, that connects so strongly with Jesus saying, don't just judge things by what you see, mm -hmm. look beneath the surface like everybody has a story 
And mm. that story often, and again, in our churches, in our small groups, our cell groups, our Bible studies, whatever you want to call them, we can mm. hide those, those stories away. We can yeah. bring out the greatest hit story of Sarah Wiseman and everyone thinks that she's doing absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and often I've found in so many relationships inside of churches is that we have this bar that we put in the place to go, no, I've got my life together. This is how it's all working. But underneath the surface, we're doing a thousand miles an hour trying to keep that image real. Totally. Jesus would be going, dude, there's no bar. Yeah. Stop trying yes. to jump it. Yeah. And I think that's a big problem that's coming with the concept of like celebrity Christianity yep. of like, I, I believe Christians should be um, like, no, I don't even believe that not thriving. I believe that Christians should prosper and it's great for them to prosper mm. and to be healthy and to look great. And, but I worry that when we, um, when we act like that's the only form of, of Christianity or in a walk with God, we're leaving out so many people who have so much to offer and mm. so much value and just as much worth because they don't fit the part. And for me, that's just heartbreaking. It's like some of the most wonderful people I've met are so rejected by society mm. and I have so much to learn from them. And um, I just, I'll never forget learning it through experience kind of thing, you know, um, just feeling like I if you knew my story, you'd know why I've put on weight. If you knew my story, you'd know. Um, you know why I'm so sensitive right now or you know like mm. I just want the church to understand that the they have the most incredible speakers sitting in their pews but they don't think they're worth yep. the platform or the investment and some of the stories that that could be shared I just I just want them to be elevated you know um, so yeah I agree <laughs> <laughs> good <laughs> I can get, amen <laughs> it goes back to that concept of being seen though because you're seeing because you're hearing and you're hearing because you're listening and you're listening because you're actually loving the person that's there in front and mm -hmm. i can't tell you how many stories i've heard from people simply because you listen you get more than what you bargain for you totally. get the whole concept of why and you're yeah. invited into it. You're trusted with it. And I think with Jesus, there was so often his questions drew those conversations out. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't just go and reach out and touch a guy and go, okay, boom, there it all is. Yeah. He would ask the question, like, what can I do for you? What can I have dinner with you? There's a beautiful relational aspects of Jesus who would actually go into the person's story. And like with Zacchaeus, he said, let's have a meal. And you can only imagine what was happening at that meal. Remember the guy that's called Legion? He was called Legion because yeah. of all the demons that they're in him. When the disciples finally stopped freaking out about a demon-possessed guy getting to Jesus, they run up, they find this guy having a conversation with Jesus. We don't even know what they were talking about, but there's something relational that was actually occurring. And I think that that man's restoration was occurring right there with Jesus because yeah. Jesus was addressing him now, not as a demon possessed dude that's out there in, in the, in the graveyard. He's actually now a guy that he sees, hears yeah. and loves. And anytime you love someone, you're actually restoring their honor and you're restoring yeah. their dignity and you're also restoring their voice. Oh, preach. That's so awesome. That's so true. When, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have nothing to add. That, I love that restoring their honor. Like, I just love that concept. I love that when you really love somebody, that's what you're doing to them because it's true. So many people have been stripped of their dignity and self worth and their honor, and they just need somebody to like see them differently and they'll start mm. to be able to see themselves in yeah. a way that they used to. That's a beautiful thing. Can I share oh. a story? Absolutely. Please. It's probably rhetorical. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, Matthew. <laughs> Matthew, that's only I've my mother. I've never once told you that. <laughs> Sorry about it. Uh, have, I ever have I ever told you my second name? Bartholomew. <laughs> I just made that up. Damon. You have told me this. I forgot. How did I forget such an important <laughs> thing? That <Now>, Damon. <laughs> I am older then. 
<laughs> so it is my name. Uh, but yeah, anyway, okay. <laughs> when when I was in uh, Lebanon a f- um, three years ago, I watched love manifest in ways that restored honor, uh, it restored dignity, and restored voice. Um, and there's a story that I've occasionally told, but it's of a we were in this one part of Beirut, which is the absolute slums and the Syrian refugees are flowing across the border and the only places they can live are in these dilapidated, bombed out parts of Beirut that are slowly being restored. So when you walk into these areas, they smell like a tip and um, it's just, it's awful. But there's this one organisation that's wo- that's working away in there and we we partner with them. Yeah. And in the partnering with them, we were asked if we could go for a walk through area of Beirut. It's like, Sarah, if you walked into it, you'd just be going, oh my gosh, how do people actually live in this place? And Mm -hmm. so it's, it's still like a ruin from when the civil war was happening, but people are now starting to live in these buildings and they're, they're restoring them like brick by brick. So it's just a really strange place to, to be, Mm -hmm. but there's all these Syrian refugees and we're partnering with this group that are working with, um, the refugees to restore honor mm-hmm. and they said to us would you like to go for a walk around this area and like well we're like yeah we'd absolutely love to do that and i was with the ceo of the company that i was with and we're walking around and this one young mum um mm-hmm. said can you come into my house and now she couldn't speak a word of english so through a translator uh, we had uh, women with us because as a man you would not be able to go into yeah. an atmosphere like that and yeah. um and so uh, we went in, we sat down and we saw this young mom with four, four kids. Um, and the oldest of those kids is six. Mm. And, uh, this young mum, she has nothing other than the, there was like a three inch mattress, a television from probably the eighties, um, and whatever this organization would give her. And so ki- babies in this area that wear like cling wrap for nappies cause they couldn't oh. afford nappies. Right. Anyway, we, we started chatting with this lady, um, through the interpreter who was working with her and I couldn't understand a word that was saying, but I could feel the love in that room profoundly. Like it was, you know, when you feel love, Sarah, you, it's just something, it does something to your spirit. Yeah. I'm sitting there in that room and you nearly, I was nearly verging on tears as I'm just listening to these two uh, speak in Arabic to each other. And so we started, we were asked if we wanted to ask some questions. And I said, so where's, where's your husband? And she said, well, he's about to turn fighting age in Syria. So he could be with the Syrian army. Um, the fighting age for ISIS is 12. So he could be fighting for ISIS. Uh, he could be looking for work or he could be dead. And I'm like, oh, okay. I, and um, so I said to them, what's fighting age for the Syrian army? And she said, 18. Now, when I saw that, I said, well, how old are you? She's 17. And she had a six-year-old child. Oh, my goodness. Yep. I have never been in such poverty, but at the same time, this organization that's actually working there on the ground and, um, it's next level mind blowing. Um, I'm sitting there feeling the love inside of a room and the honor that's been given to this mum. So this mum has been absolutely championed. This mum has been empowered. She wanted us to take her to Australia. And, but the, the, the girl who's working there just in love, just explained to her, that's not how this thing works. Yeah. They're here to support what we're doing. And so this yeah. organization in this area of Beirut have changed the uh, child um, pregnancy age from 12 on average. Mm-hmm. to 18. Wow. What? In how, in how much time has that happened? In just a few years, they're training yeah. women to in trades so that they can start earning money. And oh, I'm, that's so good. I'm sitting there on this three inch mattress on the floor, listening to this and this, the CEO of this organization is with me and he's been on many, many, many of these trips. This was my first trip. Mm-hmm. When we left that room, this guy grabs my arm and he says, did you feel 
what was in that room. And I said, do you mean love? And he goes, I have been on so many of these trips. I have never felt anything like that. That one moment, Sarah, changed me forever. And I know that's a big statement, but when you find love, when you see it, when you encounter it, when you witness it, and it's actually doing things, not just patting people on the back, it's restoring honour. It's restoring dignity. It's giving people pride in who they are again. They're standing and there's a strength that flows back into them. Their nation has been absolutely decimated. And many of these people have come out of Syria into Lebanon um, with nothing. And it wasn't that long ago where the Lebanese and the Syrians were at war. And so these pockets of grace are opening up. And this is what I'm watching. Mm. Honour. Dignity. All of this stuff is flowing back in. So for me, I came back from Lebanon with this, like people talk about me of carrying the father's heart. I mm-hmm. found it on the floor in a slum yeah. in Beirut. That's amazing. I want to go on this trip. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can handle it. That is amazing. All I just kept hearing while you were talking was the greatest of these is love. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Makes a lot of sense, right? Because someone could have gone in there and given a bunch of knowledge and it wouldn't have done anything. Yeah. See, in Lebanon, they don't recognise refugees uh, at all or very little. And so, because if they do, they have to do something about it. Like they have to, so these people are called displaced people. So they don't know, they have no identity. Their nation has, they've fled their nation and some of the stories, Sarah, like you just cannot even believe that man would do this to other humans um but to see what love can actually do and it's not just a word it's not just a hallmark card it's not just a bible verse that we roll out and say jesus loves you god so loved the world he gave his only son this is the cold face of what love can actually accomplish it's not, it's no small thing. It changes lives. And for people like yourself that carry love in such extraordinary <clears> ways, <throat> what I've often found, Sarah, is the person who carries love in extraordinary ways knows what hopelessness is. Mm-hmm. Being in those places to go, I have felt that, I have experienced the power of hopelessness, but now I've discovered something, and you obviously found it in your 20s, that was so profoundly powerful that it changes the course of your life to the point that each person who comes across your path, you're actually looking to restore their dignity, their honour. You're giving them strength by speaking the words of life back into them. Yeah? Yeah, wow. Yeah, 100%. That's like pretty much sums up my mission. That's what I want to do because it's been done to you, right? Like when yeah. when you've been made to feel... I think I said even in like our first um, recording we ever did that I was like a girl, I was like knelt down in the dirt and Jesus like knelt down beside me and mm. said, I love you and you're beautiful and I see you. And I think that's why I believe like our salvation story has a lot to do with the ministry we end up walking into. And I think that's why a lot of mine is about wanting to love people because yeah. I just felt, I mean, it should be all of us. I know that, but like, um, it feels like I'm just gonna plug my laptop in. Um, I just I would never want anyone to miss out on that experience of like feeling loved. And I I was thinking like as you're talking like that's kind of what the prophetic is. It's just mm. connecting people with like God sees you enough to well God saw that girl enough to send people to her home when the whole world didn't see her or even give her an identity. God loves her enough to send people to her and and say, I see you, God sees you, you're worthy of being acknowledged. Yeah. And that's just what I think prophecy is kind of like because we almost have so much in this Western society that we're missing all the invisible people that are right in front of us, you know, like they mm. feel so invisible, but they look together and yeah. they have it together from what we can see. The prophecy cuts through all of that. And I was talking to my dad about this today, actually, about how prophecy says to a person, like, the creator of the world took time to talk to me about you because he sees you. Hmm. 
and um that's love you know and I've seen the power of that impact people I was telling him about how I went and I haven't I've not told anyone this story, but I went through like a Porto drive through one time. I was mm. like, you know, dinner for Tim. Have I told you this story? No. <clears throat> and there was a girl serving me. And um, the minute I looked at her, I just thought she's a worshiper. Like, mm. it, you know, when God just downloads a knowledge on it, I guess it's a word of knowledge. And I was like, cool, that's cool. And I felt him say, you need to encourage her to worship me. And I was like, um, yeah but you know you go through all the excuses and next thing I know I'm driving mm. and I just it stuck with me for the whole next day to the point I rang them and said what was the name of the girl on the drive through last night at this time and her name was Sia which mm. I think is really cool because it's like yeah. a famous singer's name and so I was like okay god if I ever go through there again oh um and she's there I'll tell her you know how we put these things before god and one time I went through and was like oh wasn't there <laughs> and then um I think it was like three months later, again, getting dinner for my husband. I'm such a real wife. Um, And she was at the window and I'm like, I'm sure that's her. And so I just, I was like, it was the most um, unlovely prophecy. (laughs) I couldn't, like, I was rushed. There were cars behind me, but I was like, hi, is your name Sia? And she said, yeah. I said, I came through here three months ago and I felt God tell me to tell you that you're a worshiper and he loves your voice. And it's anointed and he loves it when you worship him. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, she probably doesn't even know, what if she doesn't know God? She'll be like, those Christians are wacky dacky. <laughs> anyway, I was like, and um, just don't give up singing. And and her face initially, she's a young girl, was kind of like, I thought, oh, no, this isn't happening. And we're all like, this isn't landing. Hmm. Um, And then I finally finished and I, like, gave her my money. <laughs> and she was like, oh, I thank you. She said, my parents are pastors and I lead a worship team at our church. Yeah. And she said, and I really needed to hear that. (laughs) And I was like, oh, like the relief you feel is just like, oh. But I was talking to my dad about how in a moment like that, you don't, you don't feel this like, well, look at me. I got that right. Mm -hmm. You feel, you feel like such a precious like the fact you get to be a part of it makes me feel loved. Mm. You know what I mean? And and seeing somebody realize that God sees them, yeah, is like watching someone come alive in, in that love and that restoration of like dignity. And it just makes me want to prophesy as much as I can to people because I just think I want you to know that not just I see you, but the Creator of the world yep. sees you and knows you and wants to talk to you. And so, like, like when I can't sleep some nights, I just lie in bed and say, God, give me a name. And mm. then randomly gives me a name and I pray for them and get a word and message them the next day. And it feels like it's, like, addictive. It's, mm. like, you, and every time God speaks and it just makes me realize he's always wanting to tell people he loves them. Like, mm. just are we listening, you know? Yep. He's always talking. Anyway, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun and it's powerful. Well, I think to finish, can you mm. prophesy to someone who feels that they are invisible? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you know, I like to take a minute. I don't want to just like speak from my. Take as long as you need, my friend. <laughs> um, well, I just feel like. Um, somebody or some people need to hear that you are not a mistake, that you're given your pregnancy, the pregnancy that you were the product of was not a mistake or an accident um, because not one baby is ever created by accident because God knit them together himself with his hands and God knit you together on purpose um, because you have a purpose and He has seen you from that very moment and hasn't taken his eyes off you since then. And you might be in a crowded room and feel like um, nobody knows you're there or cares that you're there, but God has his eyes set firmly on you and on your future. And he wants you to know that this feeling won't last forever, that the experience you're having is going to create a compassion and a love inside of you that a lot of people don't possess and that um 
what people have said about you uh, or not said enough to you does not define who you are. Mm -hmm. It defines who they are. And you are going to learn how to be so strong that you can even love those people um, because what's being created in you right now is deep and valuable character that will not be able to be shaken by the opinions of man or the rejection of man or the praise of men. And while you walk through the valley of learning to be bigger than um, people's um, perception of you, Jesus will hold your hand and the Holy Spirit will comfort you and the Father will hold you and remind you who he says you are. And there is a scripture that has always meant a lot to you that God wants to remind you of right now. And he wants to say to you, um, hold tight to me. Just hold tight to me. This won't last forever. And there is a ministry that's going to be birthed out of this feeling. Um, if you just hold tight and you keep walking with me and you will be someone who speaks to um, masses of people who have also felt invisible and unseen and you are not a mistake you're not a mistake um, God sees you and he loves you so much and he sees what you've been through and he wants to restore the honour and dignity inside of you um, and that doesn't need to be done through another person so don't wait for somebody else to do it just find it at home alone on the floor in your room in a place of longing and and intimacy with god he's going to build you up from there mm. and you'll be able to look back and know that it was just between you and him and that will be precious and um nobody else had a hand in it because he's jealous to be the one who builds you back up he's jealous to be the one who restores your heart and doesn't want another person to take credit for that um yeah that's beautiful Sarah, yeah. as you were speaking, I was thinking about people who've, you know, when you have words spoken over you, mm. they feel like they've been written on you. And I think that the people who are listening that feel like the words that have been spoken over them mm. are, are what people see when mm. they first meet them. I just want to prophesy over them that this is a moment to walk through the river of life, to let those words be washed off, to know that those words were never designed to be on you in the first place. Uh, and so those words that have stolen your identity and stolen your worth, uh, those yeah. words that have stolen um, the very real version of yourself, that once those words get washed off, uh, what people see is the, the one that God has created them uh, to be. And so this is a season of discovering of identity, discovering of name, and discovering also of the people God wants you to hang out with as well. Yeah. Because sometimes yeah. the people you hang out with may not necessarily be the ones that God has placed in your world and, and you keep doing the same old thing and getting the same old outcome. This might be an opportunity for new friends to flow so good. into those places. Amen. That's so good. Amen. Well, my friend, I think that will do us for today. Thank you, as always, just for being the open book that you are. No worries. <laughs> Chapter three is what we dealt with today. Maybe we'll go to chapter four next time. What do you think? Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's, let's do it. Thank you so much, Matt. I really enjoy these chats. Yeah. So if anyone who wants to follow you, Sarah, how do they do that? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at the mummy mission. Uh, mummy is spelt with Australian spelling. Um, or just Sarah Wiseman on Facebook. And yeah. And it's very worthwhile doing it. I follow Sarah. <laughs> She's always, uh, always connecting the heart of the authentic heart that she has with people. And uh, may more people come into that place of safety to know that they too can be as real as you can be. Thank you, my friend. We Thank shall you. talk to you very soon again. Bye, everyone. Connect with Greater Things International on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube or at greaterthingsinternational.com.